reduces to get into a car and speeds, then crashes, then dies. What impact does that have on your family, on your mum, your dad, your cousins, your uncles, your brothers, your sisters? It has a massive... That has a massive, massive impact. What we need to do as a community, as a Bradford community, is think about how we change the thinking of young people when they get behind that steering wheel and how do we improve that safety. And I think three things need to happen. One, we need a better driver training and testing system. We need better alternatives to driving for young people. And we need more investment in monitoring technology. And these are ideas that are backed by BREAK, the road safety charity. And what we also need to do, we need to educate you as young people around showing respect for other road safety users. What we do need, we do need more affordable public transport. We do need a massive, massive failing and an issue Councillor Jabbar knows I'm very passionate about. We need greater investment in youth services because youth services have a lifeline for many young people. When I was growing up, it, they were a massive lifeline for me. But many of those youth services have been cut in this city, in Yorkshire and across the country. So right now, it's a direct appeal from me to government, invest in young people and invest in youth services. And while I'm at it as well, talking about cuts in police has a massive impact on the safety of our communities. 21,000 police officers cut in the last eight years. That is a disgrace. <laughs> But what I would also say as well is the natural thing sometimes is for people to automatically blame parents, for instance, what have happened. And yeah, there is parental responsibility, but what I also say is where is the support for parents? For parents whose first language may not be English, for parents whose children are more educated than they were previously. Let's support our parents as well as give support to our young people. And one thing I have learned about Islam from <laughs> Councillor Jabbar and from many of my colleagues is that it is a peaceful religion. It's a religion which teaches respect. And I would say especially to the young people here today, that needs to be taken into account when you consider going for a driving licence and getting behind that wheel on the road. And I will end, uh, before I end, what I want to see, the headlines I want to see in the Telegraph and Argus are very clear. All you young people here, I want to read stories about how well you've done in your GCSEs, how well you've done at A-levels. I want to hear that the young people in this room and in the other rooms in this building are the pioneers of the district, are the leaders of this district, are the leaders who are going to take this district forward. And I do not want to see any more red lines like we saw yesterday on our road, yesterday, a few weeks ago with those four young men. It's a disgrace and it can be stopped. What's happening is avoidable. But we only solve this problem by working together. It's not been about a constant blame game. It's about us as a council. We are absolutely committed to tackling the scrooge of road safety. I will also pay tribute to my parliamentary colleague, Judith Cummings, who's done a massive amount of work on road safety and has recently won an award. And I'm sure she would be more than happy to get involved with the efforts here today. And it's also about the police working together with the council, with the mosques, with the churches, with other religious institutions, with other community centres. It's about working together and saying collectively, hand in hand, enough is enough. 
Enough of our young people have died. We don't want it again. And you, the young people in this room, are the ones who can change that. And I believe you are the leaders. I believe you will make the difference. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor for Dunbar for great uh, words you spelt. Uh, next, we <laughs> announce Lord Mayor Bradford of uh, Zuffer. Bradford. It's a great pleasure and I'm honored to be here this afternoon. Councillor Abdul Jabbar did ask me two days ago if I'm able to come, and I'm delighted that my office has actually given the permission for me to come in here to speak. I could have come without this chance. But it was the desire of the Council of Jabba that should come with their guardian. From the outside, sorry, from the outside I pay my tribute and my deepest condolences and sympathy to the family, to the parents, their friends, their families who have lost their sons at this prime age. <coughs> Certainly it's a very tragic death and I think their parents will remember that decades to come and even we, as some of you, will be remembering this incident for decades, for years and years to come. They have given their lives, but about it remains to see if we learn the lesson from their death and pay our way to see that the driving, the hectic driving is not an answer. Drive within a means that we are safe. The other road are users. And if we don't have any more accidents in coming years, and I think when their death will have paved some way forward and I hope that that will so. And I'm very pleased to see so many youngsters will come in here together and I hope that they will learn a lesson from the death of these four youngsters. That's what a tragedy it was. Their life has not been wasted. If we all learn and try to avoid similar sort of accident, I think, then we will, they, their death has been achieved a great martyr. And I think it's uh, the Imam Malana Asim has made a very significant, a very powerful speech on the funeral. Also, I was very far behind, but I'll go listen a few words. And if it, this speech can have something, effect on you, on the community, then I think we'll be able to avoid this sort of tragic death. But I'm grateful for coming here tonight, and, and Council Jabbar Sahib, and Council Nazar Musang, and many other respected, distinguished guests from the community, like Council uh, Dunbar. And please, my plea to you is, driving actively, fast is the answers. You ask those parents who have lost their sons at the age of 4, 21, 19. It's a tragic death, and we need to avoid, and I'm sure we can avoid that. There's no reason why we couldn't avoid that. You tell your friends and your relatives that driving fast is not an answer, and no one is going to pay the reward it only ultimately results in death. And I hope that we learn this lesson and we save our community and the grief that we are going through. Thank you, Councillor Jabbar. Councillor Nazar Musang. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor of Bradford, as I thought he started climbing words. Perhaps there's a lot of people are coming in. Can we all push forward slightly, please? The people are coming to make space, please. <coughs> Can I please announce uh, Super Intendant uh, Dan Greenwood to the test, please. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Um, I'd like to start by introducing myself. So some people in this room might know me as Officer. You might know me as copper. You might know me as pig. You might know me worse. 
Some of you might think I was bullied at school and this is my way of making me feel better. In reality, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son and I'm a brother, just like many of you in this room here today. But the difference is, I've chosen to do this as a job. So yeah, that does mean I've stopped some people in Bradford when they've been driving. It does mean I've given them pendant points on the licence. It does mean I've banned people from driving and in some cases I've sent them to prison for what they've done when they've been driving a car. And do you know what? I've got absolutely no remorse about that because of the impact they've had. Because when we've done something like that, when we've put somebody to prison, when we've taken a licence away, that's given us an opportunity to inject, to make the roads a little bit safer. This time, I've had to pick up the consequences when we've not been able to do that. Pick up the consequences of someone else's actions when they've caused this to happen. And I'll tell you now, I've seen things that have given me sleepless nights. I've seen things that have given me nightmares. I've seen things that have made me finish work, go home, lock myself away from my wife and cry. I've seen the impact dangerous driving has both on me and my colleagues as professionals, the way it impacts on the service we can give to wider Bradford when we're dealing with those issues. I've seen the impact it has on people when they're sat in our cells, when they get told they're being charged for causing death by dangerous driving and everything they knew falls away right there. And most importantly, I've seen the impact on a family learning that their loved one isn't coming home. That way. For example, like on New Year's Day, when before lunchtime in a brand new year, I was dealing with two people in the 70s, dead in the middle of the road. Their car hit, was hit so hard by another vehicle that they were both thrown out the window. Like on a warm day in October, when I pulled the tarpaulin over a young lady laid in the middle of a busy road having just been pronounced dead and the driver didn't even stop. Or like the time I had to help pull somebody out of their car who'd crashed so hard when we pulled them out their foot was severed off. These stories are real and there are many, many more. Now the circumstances are all very different. They're in different parts of West Yorkshire, different ages, different sexes, different religions. But one thing united them all. None of them got to where they were going. Each of them ended up there. So maybe some of you have been unfortunate enough to be stopped by my staff in the past. Maybe we've given you a ticket, maybe we've told you to fix your car, and you just think that we're the lowest of the low for doing it. But guess what? Because this might come as a surprise. When we launch an operation in the district, when we seize a vehicle because it's dangerous, when we issue points for driving through a red light or for speeding, my staff don't get bonuses, they don't get money for the organisation, we don't get massive kicks out of it because we've made your day or we've, we've ruined your day. We're trying to stop you from putting yourself in a coffin or worse, throwing your life away, destroying a family and putting someone else in there. So what is it that we want? Why am I here? Do I want you to stop aspiring to hire, to hire fancy cars, particularly next week at Eid? No. Do I expect that you should stop taking pride in your cars, stop wanting that Audi or that Range Rover car? Not at all. Because I was a young lad once. I used to aspire to own a souped-up car with tinted windows and lowered suspension and a big exhaust and the best sound system of all my mates. And do you know what? As long as it's legal, as long as it doesn't cause annoyance, as long as it doesn't cause a nuisance to anybody else, I am absolutely fine with that. Please do fill your boots. Cars are beautiful machines, and that's why they've got that certain appeal. That's why they're on posters, they're in magazines, why programmes like Top Gear are so popular. And there's nothing wrong with wanting a car like that, as long as you show respect for the road and for other road users. There's even nothing wrong with you wanting to get a fix of adrenaline, wanting to race cars, as long as you do it somewhere appropriate. Do it on a racetrack, go to a go-kart track, do it when other people are out of harm's way. Because no matter how sexy that car might be, how good a driver you think you are, when you run out of talent or something goes wrong, all cars are capable of being lethal. Be that a Ferrari, be it a Maserati, be it a 50 quid Peugeot. But don't just take my word for it. Look at history, look at some of the best drivers in the world. Would Ayrton Senna have been killed behind the wheel of a Formula One car in Imola if cars were completely safe? Would 147 motorbike riders have been killed in 99 Isle of Man TTs if racing round close roads wasn't without risk? Would over 1,700 people have been killed on the roads in the country last year if there was nothing to be worried about? 
Roads and cars are inherently dangerous and deserve your respect. And if you don't do that, in the blink of an eye, you could crash and seriously injure yourself or someone else. You could be laid on the slab, you could be stood in the dock. In a split second, lives change. So actually, why I am here is to ask you one thing, and that one thing is so painfully simple, I kind of feel embarrassed asking you. I want you to drive with respect. Drive with respect for other people, for other pedestrians, for other drivers, and for those people that are in your car. Remember that moment you took your driving test, how careful you were, how observant you were. That's all we're looking for. Would you have raced outside traffic and cut drivers up just after you took your test? Would you have abandoned your cars on double yellow lines or the pavements so other people can't use the roads properly? Would you have kept sailing through a red light when you're 100 metres away from it and suddenly going to amber? Would you have accelerated as fast away from lights as you can just to slam on? I don't think you would. So my question to you is, why is that acceptable now? And if you sat here thinking, I get it, there are some people in here who don't. Because otherwise, why yesterday were my staff dealing with the aftermath of another serious incident not 200 yards from where four young lads lost their life two weeks ago? Oh, and by the way, guys, um, if you think you're driving in a way that impresses girls, I've got news for you. I've got an elderly teenage daughter. And when you go racing past her, when you're shouting from your windows and honking your horn, she doesn't think you're cool. She thinks you're idiots. And I'm not saying, by any means, it's just you guys in this room that are to blame, because I genuinely don't believe that. This is every community, but now is the time for communities to say enough is enough. Because between us all, we are destroying the reputation of this city. We are destroying the reputation of Bradford because of the standard of driving. And that's bad for all of us, and it affects all of us. It damages the economic well-being of the city. That means fewer jobs, it means less investment, and it means more snide jokes about Bradford. Not only is that driving killing people, it's killing the city. So next time you're behind the wheel of a car, and you, or you're a passenger, and you decide you're going to race from the lights and see how fast you can go, or you have a smoke and a chill and then decide that you're going to go out for a cruise, or you get a call or a text and decide to answer it um, or reply whilst you're driving, or you decide to use the road as a racetrack, race track, you have two very simple choices. Number one, be smart, use your brain in your head, and accept responsibility. Or two, tell yourself it won't happen to you. Pretend you're invincible, but your luck will run out.
said my name is Salim Zaid. I am no scholar, I am no imam, and I am no speech maker. I am a normal individual. My occupation, I am a bus driver. For 20 odd years, I have been driving buses in Bradford, alhamdulillah. We all have hobbies. As youths, you will play football, cricket, but most of all, you will go to the gym. Mashallah, I can see a lot of uh, henchmen in here. Mashallah, big lads. I work different shifts every day. What do I do in my spare time? Before my shift, after my shift, my days off work, when I have a week or two weeks off work, what do I do? Ask me. I wash the dead. I wash the deceased. I do it feast, Bilillah. I do it voluntary. Brother Kabir, who is sat there with the white salwar kameez there, he will ring me. He'll say, Paps, or he'll say, Papa, meaning big brother. Are you free to come down to perform a gusal? Somebody has died. 99% of the time, if I am not working, I will go. I have seen all kinds of deaths over the years, from the very young, the young, the teenagers, middle-aged and the elderly, cancer victims, heart attack victims, organ failure victims, car accident victims, suicides and murders, horrific and gruesome injuries. If I was to tell you tonight, Wallahi, you wouldn't sleep of the injuries that I've seen. Giving ghusl is a very big responsible job and needs to be done once and needs to be done correct. I have watched many car victims, but I am forbidden, I am forbidden to reveal their injuries. I will and not I will not reveal nothing about nobody that I have watched whether they have been in an accident or otherwise. We are distanced from this reward of giving a gusal. Our youngsters are too distant and have no knowledge or interest in giving a gusal, washing the dead. Majority of our elders don't even have a clue. We should learn and participate and earn the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many hadiths regarding the swab of giving gusals. But I will only mention one due to the lack of time we have tonight. There's a Hadith Shari book, Subban Ibn, Subban Ibn Majah, sorry, Sunan Ibn Majah. In there, there is a chapter, Rituals of a Funeral. Azrat Ali, Allah be pleased with them, has narrated that the Messenger of Allah has said, whoever, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever washes a deceased person, shrouds him, embalms him, carries him, and offers the funeral prayer for him, the janazah, and does not disclose, does not disclose what he has seen. He will emerge from his, from his sins as on the day he was, as his mother bore him. Recently, over the few years and months, we have many car accident victims, many deaths. Atar, Hamza, Salik, Adnan Shafiq, Yasib Ali, I have watched a few of them. The most recent ones, the Tola Lane victims, Murtaza, Tayyab, Arbaz and Zishan, I watched three of them. Again, I, am, I, I cannot tell you, I am bound from telling you or mentioning any injuries to any individual, but I can give you examples. I will give you examples of those individuals or those people who can die in car accidents. Again, they are just examples. If a car hits a hard object, a wall, a tree, a house, a lamppost, whether it's at high speed or low speed, that vehicle is plastic, it's tinny, it will disintegrate. What will happen to the contents of that vehicle? What will happen to the passengers? The arms will break, the bones will fracture, Arms and legs can be amputated. Heads severed. Stomachs open with the organs hanging out. Heads open, skulls broken, noses, jaws broken. Who has to deal with this? 
the emergency services. Then what happens? They go to the coroners. Post-mortems are carried out. What happens after the post-mortem has been carried out? The bodies are given to the undertakers. Kabir Saab, Muslim Funeral Services, Darfield Street, Lumley and Bradford. All I can tell you, the bodies will be clean. That's all. They're clean, there'll be no blood. The process of the ghusl then starts when me, Kabir or Janaid guide and help the families through the ghusl. As we wash the bodies, the father will be there, the brothers will be there, the cousins, the grandfather might be there, the individuals, young friends will be there, they'll be around the wash bed, we'll be washing them, they'll all be crying, they'll all be upset, tears rolling down their eyes. When the individual has been washed, we place them in this coffin here, with, a, with the family, the friends around, the father crying away, tears rolling down his eyes like a river. Even though I might not be part of that family, but I am a human. I have feelings. It's a struggle for me. Our roads, our streets are plagued and diseased with boy races. Wannabes who will prove it to the next man that we are better than us. That we are better than you. How can you be better? I've had young men, gangsters, wannabes with me in that room when I watched some individuals. They have walked out. They don't have the goats. On the streets, there are 10 men. You can't even watch your father. You can't watch your uncle in there. What wannabes are you? What boy races are you? Why are you trying to prove on the roads? If you can't watch your own family members. Are you gangsters? Are you wannabes? What are you trying to prove? Parents, please. Before that, I, I want, there's something else I need to say. This mayhem, this madness, what I've just said about these wannabes boy dancers, it needs to stop. Enough is enough. We need to stop this. A message to the parents. Parents here present. Parents, parents watching us. Please educate your children. Educate the youth, the youth I urge you, educate your friends, educate your school, college, university friends, educate your madarsa, your masjid friends, and those individuals that work, teenagers, educate your work colleagues. This mayhem, it needs to stop. If any of them listen to you, you have gained reward here and in the Akhra, inshallah. Convey our message we are giving tonight. Don't let it stop. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, to save one life is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. Let this chain begin here today. Don't let it stop. And I plead with you all. My last message, please listen to me carefully. I plead with you all. Those present and those watching, don't you be the next victim. Don't you be the next victim. That we have to wash and or help your family wash. It's a very heart touching speech by Brother Arun Zeb. I hope I got that right. Yeah, but that's a very special kind of speech he's gave. We see the coffin down here, and we've seen the amount of deaths in the last couple of months in Bradford. Obviously, you can tell my accent, I'm, from Bradford. I'm not from Bradford, I'm from London. I've been in just over a year. And I've been blessed, I mean, to have Imam Asim, Imam Adil, present in a mosque down here. I read namaz for three, four years in London. And I never met the brothers, never met the imams in my life. And to come down here to see them, I mean, I can speak to them face to face. They made a big change in the youth. The youth nowadays, obviously, don't respect their parents, don't respect their elders. Like you say, we all want to be a wannabe gangster. I mean, we have to respect our parents. We've got to talk to our parents. 
If we have issues, talk to your parents. Talk to the mosque. Speak to your moms. These are our guides. These are our wasila. I mean, if we have an issue, you can't talk to your friends. You can't talk to your father, your mother, your sister. Come to the mosque to talk. I mean, we have social services you can talk. You talk to police, they have a guidance. But they please, I mean, if any issues there, speak. I mean, you can sort problems out. I mean, this is all about talking. We've got to help each other. Yeah, I mean, as a Muslim, I mean, as a, a human being, a different religion, different cohesion, we're all one in the day. If we can save one life, that's what we've got to do. I mean, it, life is very special. We only get it once. Look at the youth down here. We're all young there. I've been young myself. Things I wish I, do, I didn't do, but I've done. But we learn from there. We experience. And obviously, if we all get together and make an effort, I mean, these crimes, these rates, these accidents will stop. It could be someone's mother down there, someone's sister, someone's brother, someone's father. An accident will damage down there, you know. We can't bring the life back. It'll end in one place, like the coffin down here. So um, what I'll do, I won't take too much of your time. I'll put the Imam Saab down here, the main event host. And inshallah, we'll go from here, then we'll follow from Maghrib. second if you're gonna say it, you wanna say on the mic. You don't wanna say it to me only. If you've got a story that you need to tell to come over here. Salam alaikum everybody. You've only got two minutes. I feel bad but last Saturday me and my wife were driving off City Road on Worthington Street and these young lads in a car drove onto the main road, ran directly into us. I got out, luckily we both alive. Cars badly damaged. I got out, the lad got out, he phoned his dad, his dad said do it on her. I got his number plate, phoned the police. When the police went to his house, his, his father said they sold the car that day. End of. Now, if that's what parents are telling their kids, what we got here, my wife and me could have been in there. That's all I've got to say. I've got to get this off my chest. You know. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Just before I begin, if everyone can move forward, shuffle forward a little bit. I'm not going to speak for too long. I aim to finish just after Salat al Maghrib. I might be 10 minutes over, so bear in mind. We'll keep that in mind. Alameen. Alhamdulillah, Allah is the one who has given us this, and we are not going to be able to do it. Allah is the one who has given us this, and we are not going to be able to do it. Allah is the one who has given us this, and we are not going to be able to do it. كل نفس ذائكة الموت وإنما توفون عجورهم يوم القيامة فمن زهزها إلى النار عن النار وأدخل الجنة فقد فاز وما الحياة الدنيا وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور صدق الله مولانا العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم وأكرم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين صلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا رحمة للعالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and sending salutations, peace and blessings upon the best of creation, the jewel and crown of creation, the beloved of Allah Almighty, the coolness to our eyes, the purpose of our lives, the reviver of our hearts, the inspirer to our minds, the awakener of our souls, the most honored one, the most praised one, the most revered one, the most generous one, the most kind one. Undoubtedly, he is the most beautiful one. None other than Sayyiduna Muhammadur Rasulullah. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa barak wa sallam. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said in the Quran, Kullu nafsin dha'ikatul mawt. Every single soul shall taste death. Everything that Allah has created must come to an end. And then Allah Jalla Jalaluhu continued in that verse. And he said, وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْكِيَامَةِ You will be paid back what you deserve on the day of judgment. فَمَنْ زُهْزِهَ عَنِ النَّارِ And he who has saved himself from the fire, وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ And has been admitted into paradise, فَقَدْ فَازِ Certainly, he is successful. He has succeeded. And then Allah Almighty finished this verse by saying, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ What is this life? What is this life except a playground of deception? مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ this life is a deception. When ma and illa kum, in the Arabic language, those of you who have studied will know that it gives the faida of hasar, that this life only is a deception. Allah did not create me and you to be gangsters. Allah did not create me and you to waste our lives. Allah did not create me and you so that we can terrorize people. Allah did not create me and you to harm people. Allah did not create me and you to upset your parents. Allah did not create me and you to behave in an antisocial manner. Allah did not give you life for you to go and blow it. Allah did not give you a life for you to go and hit a tree. Allah did not give you a life for you to go and blow someone's house up. Allah did not give you a life that on Friday nights you go out and you drink yourself. So much that you don't know when, what time you uh, arrive at home in the early hours of the morning. Allah did not give you a life to torture your mothers, to disrespect them and dishonor them. And you may say, I don't disrespect my mother. But the moment you walk outside that house, after the hours that she has said, you have disrespected her. The moment you raise your voice at your mother, you have disrespected her. The moment you have said off to your mother, you have disrespected her. The moment you... Turn your back to your father. You've disrespected him. Allah did not give you life. He did not give you the beauty of this life. He did not give you such a gift for you to go and destroy it. For you to go and take your own life. You have no right to do that. That's why suicide is haram in Islam. You have no right to go out and take your own life. To put other people's lives in danger. Why? Because you have no control over anyone else. Ultimately, you only have control over yourself to a certain limit. Beyond that, it is what Allah wills. But when you get behind that wheel and you're driving that R8 or a RS6 or a RS3 or you're driving a car that's stolen or you're driving a car that's fast, 650 brake horse, 750 brake horse, the car sounds good, looks good, SVR, you name the cars, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, the moment you get behind that wheel and you're a good boy, you ain't even a wannabe, you ain't even a bad boy. But the moment the music comes on, Tupac, Biggie, whatever gangster songs you listen to, and you're driving that car and you get that urge, that urge that I want to put my foot down because this road is empty right now. There is nothing in my way to hinder me from me fulfilling my adrenaline rush. And when you hit that speed, 140 down the road, whether it's Canal Road, Leeds Road, Great Houghton Road, Duckworth Lane, 
whatever these roads are, Lady Pool Road, uh, the Wimslow Road, all these roads that you have where people go and take their big cars and they think they're big and they think they're bad. That's what a car does. You have to rely on a car to make yourself feel good. You have to rely on your clothes to make yourself feel good. Is this the state that you've got to? You think wearing good clothes makes you a good person. You think driving a good car makes you a good person. You've got it wrong, completely wrong. That's not what makes you good. What makes you good is when you see an old woman walking and you help her out. What makes you good is when you save people's lives. When you do jobs like Aurangzeb does, where he washes dead bodies. That's what makes you good. What Dan Greenwood does, saving people's life as a policeman. That's what makes people good. That's what makes good when you do jobs like Richard Dumba, counselors who work hard to make Bradford a safer place. That's you contributing to Bradford. You're not contributing to Bradford. You're not contributing to Islam. If you think you're a bad boy because you've lined your beard, you think you're a bad boy because you're driving 160 miles per hour, you're a fool. You're a wannabe. You ain't no bad man. You ain't sat with no bad man. What did Aurangzeb say? I've seen thugs and gangsters on those streets. When they stood in that Ghusl Khana, they trembled. They don't even know how to wash their father's bodies. You should be ashamed. Ashamed of yourself. You should lower your head down if you cannot wash your father's body. If you are 50 years old and you don't know how to give your father ghusl. You are 28 years old and you don't know how to give your father ghusl. Wallahi, I am so happy that my father and my mother made me study. You know why? My whole studies led me to the day that I washed my dad's body. I lowered my dad's body. I did the kafan on my dad's body. I put him inside his grave. I prayed for my father. I'm a proud son of my father. Do you know why? Because that's what he lived for. He lived his entire life to see that day that his sons will then give him the farewell and that send-off that he deserves. What are you doing? You go out at 6 in the morning. You go out at 11 at night. You go and you get stoned. How many Buddha heads do we know? How many lads do we know abuse drugs? Weed, cocaine, heroin. How easily accessible they are on the street. They're out there, zooted up, stoned. Don't know what's going on. As soon as they see the blue lights flash and boom, paranoia kicks in. I've got to save myself. I've got to go and do something. So he takes the chase. He takes the chase. He goes, boom. They've drunk all night. They go and they drink. They buy booze and drink it over the limit. Non-Muslims may drink alcohol. In Islam, alcohol is prohibited. Our Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said that alcohol is the mother of all evils. Then a person, there's a story that you may have heard. Three people. One, he was given, one man was given an option. He had three options. He could have raped a woman, he could have killed a child, or he could have drunk. You know what he took? He said, I'm going to drink. How dare I kill a man and a woman? How dare I kill a child? I don't want to live on that. You know what this guy did? He went and he drank. He drank. He drank. As a punishment to get out, he drank. He got out. He drank so much, he ended up killing the mother. He drank so much, he ended up killing the girl. What happened? Where did it all start from? That bit of booze that our people drink. You know those, the Jack Daniels, the, the Coke mixtures, the Red Bull mixtures. Sat in the car, you think we're stupid? You think we're fools? You think we don't know what goes on out there? We've lived in the streets. We know what goes on out there. Just because we don't do it, doesn't mean we don't know it. Just because we don't do it, doesn't mean we don't know what's going on out there. Mr. Greenwood is sat here, detective superintendent, high in the police force. He will tell you, he doesn't do it, but you can tell from a mile off. When that lad walks in with a man bag on, thinking he's ten men, ten men. This man bag business. I know women had bag, bags. Since when did men start wearing bags? Since when? You know why? You've got to carry that tennis. You've got to carry that eight. You've got to carry those drugs. You're peddling left and right. You're a dog on the street. You're running around like this, back and forward, for someone else, so that you can feed. And when you feed, what do you feed? Haram? What do you give your children? Haram? When you feed them haram, what do you expect? 
if the input is haram, what's the output going to be? I ask you, if in is haram, out is haram. If all your life, our parents have been illegally claiming benefits, when we didn't need benefits, when we've illegally claimed, you think it's halal to do this? It's haram. It's haram. When you've done that, 20 years down the line, your son's locked up and he thinks it's cool. To go into Amli prison, he thinks he's a bad boy. I know so many young lads in the prisons and they think they're 10 men. They think I'm cool. I, you know, my life is fulfilled. I feel like I've achieved. Why? Because I ended up in Amli. I ended up in, in uh, the one in Manchester. I ended up in all these prisons. You look at them and you think, is this your life? You think you're a gangster? You think you're a bad boy? You ain't no gangster or bad boy. You ain't no thug. You could just because you spend some time in a 4x4. Four four. You ain't no bad boy. That's a dog's life. What life do you have? My brother started praying. MashaAllah. Very good. For how long? Till you're out? You turn to God when there's nothing left. You turn to Allah when you have nothing. When you needed Allah. When it was time to ask Allah. Ma'am Saab, do dua. I've got a court case. You know, something goes wrong. Make dua, it goes right. You do dua. You turn to Allah. You do man, the niyaz. Your mother's crying. She says, Me itna niyaz ke mara bari ho ja. How are you going to get bari? You think all of a sudden a miracle is going to occur and your son's going to go free? What were you doing as a mother allowing your son out at three in the morning? What were you doing as a father allowing your son out at three in the morning? What is there to do at three in the morning? Are you a taxi driver? Have you just finished from the restaurant? No. You're an 18, 19 year old who didn't do well in school, who didn't get the grades, who ain't employed. And you know what? You've ended up spending the entire night out. You spent your entire night out for what? For whom? To please whom? And in the end, where have you ended up, my brother? Where have you ended up? You've ended up in there. You know why we bought this coffin in? So you can start visualizing. Your whole life, 50, 60, 40, 20, 30, 35, 34, all this year that we live. You know, we all have to prepare for what? That box there. That's your crib. That's your Ferrari. That is it. You will end up in there. I guarantee and promise you that. Look at that coffin there. There's no one in there. But that's going to become someone's the moment Kabir gets a call. There's a funeral. Boom. There you go. He's inside there. She's inside there. So what life did you live? I ask you, what life did you live? You should drink, smoke, gamble, gambling issues. And what has that led you to? Led you to becoming the man that you are now. Leading you to become what? Six feet under. Where everyone shall end up in the end. And then we see, we see this image. Everyone wants to have an image. Because we see it on Snapchat, we see it on Facebook, we see it on social media. We look at how he's doing it and you think, I've got to be the same. I've got to have that car. You don't even afford the car. You, 60 years ago, was what? You were pushing donkeys about. You were working in the farms. And now all of a sudden, you've come to the big western world and it's hit you hard. You know where we have lost it? Shall I tell you? I can easily sit here and blame parents. I can easily sit here and blame mosques which I will talk about, you know, where we've lost it. We live a life without Allah present inside it. We have no consciousness of God. We live this sort of life. There's no fear left in our hearts. We ain't scared no more. We're lawless and fearless. And I'm talking about those young lads. We are lawless and fearless. Because you think, I've took a red, I've took a 30, no problem. 
I've done it once, I've done it twice. Human nature, I'll get away with it again. But it's only a matter of time, only a matter of time, before you are caught. Either you're caught, like Dan said, by them, or you're caught in there. We have to lower you in. You must die one day. Why don't you remain conventional? Why do you have to be unconventional? Why do you have to risk your own life? Does your life mean nothing to you? Does your life mean nothing to you? Did your father and mother bring you into this world? Did Allah give you a life for nothing? Allah Almighty has never created anything without a purpose. Everything has a purpose. You have a purpose on this earth. When our father, Sayyidina Adam, the Prophet Adam, he ate from the forbidden tree, he was sent onto this earth. What did Allah say in the Quran? Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I am sending my deputy on this earth. I am sending my ambassador on this earth. I am sending a man of responsibility onto this earth. Humans are responsible. Humans are people of integrity. Humans are who? People who understand responsibility. What do we find? An age of irresponsibility. What is that age of irresponsibility? The youth age. Youngsters, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. You know what's sad? Even 30, 40 year olds get the buzz. They think they're Jeremy Clarkson's as well. They think they're Paul Walker's. You see Paul Walker where he ended up? He lived his entire life filming for Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious. In the end, the way he lived, the way he died. You know what it was? He was on a set. It is a movie. Get this into your heads. It's a movie. They have health and safety in place. They have stuntmen. They break legs and bones, even if it's orchestrated and choreographed. You ain't no stuntman. You're doing what they do in the movies on these roads. And there's no stunt there. If it doesn't go right, boom, finish. Four have gone. One has gone. Two have gone. Three have gone. Two are critical right now. Last night, Howarth Road, you all see the video circulating. This is another stupid thing about our people. Somebody is dying across the road, and people have got the audacity to get their cameras out and make videos. Shameless act. Besharmi and Bagherti, that you are standing videoing. If you had an ounce of faith in your heart and Iman, an ounce of care, you wouldn't be standing in your rooms videoing. You'd be out there trying to save their lives and helping the police and not saying, your problem, you deal with it. No, you create the problem. Sadly, they have to deal with it. I have to deal with it. Richard has to deal with it. Lord Mayor has to deal with it. Prominent men in the community have to deal with it. We suffer. You know who suffers the most? Your mother and father has to deal with it. They have to go to cemetery road, school more, cemetery, and they have to pray. And you know when you want to, I want to sit with those parents and ask, how do you feel? What is going on? And I'll tell you, they'll say, my life, our life has ended. My son's gone. He was only 18, 19, 20. He was 22. He had his whole life ahead of him. You know, when you don't pick up responsibilities, when you don't do what is right, then this is what the conclusion and outcome is. We have to do events like this to tell young people, boys, drugs ain't good for you. Drinking ain't good for you. You are no Pablo Escobar. You are not ghost in power. You are none of this. Get it out of your head. You watch these things, but you ain't that. Be your own man. Develop yourselves to become good men. Develop yourselves. You know, we Asian Mirpuri community, we lack development. We think, Kapre line, Khana, Puttar Mara, Thika school jane. How do you know he's going to school? How do you know your son is in school? Oh, he's skiving. How do you know your son is at university or skiving? 
How do you know your son's doing good or is he doing bad? How do you know? Do you have CCTV cameras on him? But I tell you, those parents who know their children, they know what their son is like. They know what their daughters are like. You know what's sad? When that son comes in and he slips 4,000 on the table and says, Hey, mom, this is for you. Money. No problem. Money. No problem. They don't ask, where did you get the money from? They don't ask that question. Son, where did you get this money from? What did you do with this? No. What did they say? He's putting food on the table. What food? Haram? When you put haram in, what comes out? Haram. When you put drug money on the table for your parents, what comes out? No, no, bro. That's in a separate unit. We've got that stashed away. We don't give it to our mothers and fathers. Oh, no, you don't. Really, don't you give it? Are you sure? Your father knows that you're a drug dealer. What does he say? He's a businessman. Business. Which business? He's peddling, dealing. He ain't no businessman. He's a murderer. He's killing people. My brothers and sisters, sisters are here as well. You know where sisters play the key role? They are the mothers. They are the mothers. They are everything. Our fathers go out and work. Our mothers are at home looking after. What are you doing? What, is our, what are our mothers doing? I'm 28. I'm an imam. You've all come to listen to my talk. Why am I here today? Why? Who is it? Why? Who do I talk about the most? Who? My mom. My mother. It is all my mother's doing. This. Everything. You see, if mothers are strong, parents now, parents now, are more scared of the children than children are of their parents. Sad reality. Sad reality. The son dictates, the father has to listen. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, father said, son did. There was no left or right. Now it's changing. So we need to adapt. We need to be in a position where you do not lose respect of your child. Your, your son fears you still. Your son respects you still. What does he think? Uh, my dad. Who's my dad? What's my dad? My dad? They have no father. They have no mother. They have no relatives. They're just selfish. Me, me, me. That's the, the psyche and mentality of these people. It's all about me. What am I doing? Where am I going? What level am I on? It's not about you, my brother. You came in this world. You have a responsibility. You have parents. You have children. Accept your responsibility. Grow up. Be mature. Stop living a childish life. Stop living your life on the road. Stop risking lives. You are not bad, you are not cool. You are not a gangster. I'm telling you, that is not what gangsters do. This is not the way of gangsters. You've got it all wrong. You're not cool that you've got 10,000 people following you on social media. I've got loads of friends. Where? On social media. Have you met them? Never. He's got so many friends on Facebook. He's probably got three in real life. In the social life, in the social world, I've got friends. You consider him your friend, the one you've never met. You've never met him, you've never seen him, and what do you say? He's my friend. This is the mentality now. This is our mentality. He's my friend. Why? I talk to him on social media. My friend, they're not your friends. Friend is he who tells you the truth. And who's your best friend? Your mother and father. The true real mothers and fathers who take responsibility, who sit their children down and tell them, this is how it is. This is what you should do. Not those parents who neglect their children, who don't care about their children. They go out at three in the morning. They sleep peacefully. Why? They gave me money. Don't ask where it's come from. I got the money. Your son turns up with a 30, 40,000 pound car. How dare you not ask him? In this world, the father and mother have the right to ask. Where did he get that car from? 
Whose car is that? Go give that car back. Your father worked all his life and he didn't have this car. And today you're driving a 30, 40 grand car. Look at the state of your father and look at you. No, but that's my father, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. If that's your father and that's how he's been, go spend it on your father first. Buy him a 40 grand car and say, Dad, this is for you. You're my father. I love you. I respect you. I honor you. I do it for you so that you smile. Instead, what do they do? Say, no chance. I ain't going to get my dad it. Me. I've made it. Who are you? Who are you? هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ هِينٌ مِّنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ مَذْكُورًا Surah Al-Insan, Allah said, Was there not a time on man, on the human race, whether he wasn't even a thing to be mentioned? Humans didn't exist. You was nobody once upon a time. And all of a sudden you think you are the Fir'aun. You are the Nimrud. You think you're the gangster. What are those gangsters? Who's Fir'aun? In the end, he drowned in the sea. Who's Nimrud? A mosquito ate him alive. This is who those gangsters were. They had money. They had women. They had children. They had wealth. They had cars. They had everything. And you think you're bad. Because you wear a fake Rolex. Fake Gucci and Armani bag. Get a life. Get a life. That is no life. You are not cool. You are not bad. Go earn halal money. My brother, I will guarantee you buy the Lambo, you buy the Ferrari, you buy the Gucci, you buy the Armani. Do it right. Islam doesn't say you can't wear Gucci and Armani. It says wear Gucci and Armani. It doesn't stop you from that. To the point Nabi Ali Salatu Salam said, if you're wealthy and you don't spend, you are doing wrong. Your duty is to spend on your family. First and foremost, do that. But if you're earning it through haram, my brother, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. In the end, you're going to end up there. That's it. That's life. This is part life. That's the real life. We're Muslims. We have to prepare for that day. The day we meet Allah. There. Look at that coffin. Every single one of you. Look at it. Whilst I'm talking. Look. That is it. By Allah, that is life. I live 60 years here. Until the day of judgment, I will be living in that box. Put your whole life into perspective. Is it really worth it? Getting in that car and driving fast. Is it really worth it? Getting stoned every night. And then taking it out on your poor wife at home and children. Is it really worth it? Drinking away and killing your liver and kidneys. Is it really worth it? That you go and gamble everything your mother and father saved. Just to feed your dirty habits. Is it worth it? No. It's not worth it. Because we're Muslims, we believe in La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. We will die one day. Every soul shall die. Prepare for that day when you will meet your Lord. Ya ayyuhal insanu, ma gharraka bi rabbika al kareem. O man, what has deceived you from your generous Lord? What is it that's deceived you? This life is what's deceived me and you this all this around us we think this is life watches cars houses we material you don't own nothing let me tell you another powerful story of one man he was walking with someone they were walking on park lane in london have you been to park lane those of you who haven't been to park lane don't go because we're not millionaires. But if you want to see, then go check it. Millionaires, big houses. Walking there one day, and he said to that person, I own this house. You see, this mansion, it's mine. He said, it's not yours. You don't own it. He says, I'm telling you, I own this, this millionaire part. It's mine. I own it. He said, you've got it wrong, man. He says, no, I own it. I bought it. I'll show you the, the deal, the contract, the solicitors. It is in my name. He went to land registry, took it off. He said, here, look. Look, I own it. Okay. He says, you own it? He said, before you bought it, who owned it? So-and-so person. And before them, who owned it? So-and-so person. And before them, who? So-and-so. He said, for one moment, think. 
Do you not think at this very same spot that you're standing and telling me I owned it, they were saying the same thing back then as well? They said, I own it. This is mine. And then they died. And then it was bought. And then it continued. And that is life. What are me and you? Custodians. We do not own anything. Nothing. Please bring me an example. I'm asking you right now. Bring me an example who took his wealth with him in his grave, in that box. Bring me the man who took gold with him. Bring me the man who took his Rolexes with him. Please, I'm asking you. Bring me a Muslim who did that inside that box. In the end, he goes with two pieces, three pieces of cloth. Three pieces of cloth. That 30,000 pound wardrobe, his children will fight over. His family will fight over. They'll give it to the charity and say, this is yours. So what's life in the end then? What is it? Is this life? Is this life or is that life? What's worth preparing for? The grave. Where you're going to stay longer than in this world. But you know why this world is more important than that world? What you do here is what you will receive in the hereafter. If you mess it up here, it's messed up for you there. If you do it right here, if you take responsibility here, if you live by the Quran and Sunnah here, you live, abide by the law of the land. Did Nabi Ali Salat was Salam not advise the Sahaba that if you go into non-Muslim territory, abide by the law of that land, live by the law of that land. Did not Sayyidina Jafar and Uthman, Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, go to Ethiopia, Abyssinia, and the ruler at that time was a Christian. Did they not abide by the law of that land? Tell me where the Sahaba didn't abide. Did not, not, Mus did not Muslims abide by the law of the land in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in these countries? Muslims abided by the laws of those lands. When the non-Muslims seen, they seen the fragrance of the true beauty of Islam, they started to accept this deen. They began to accept Islam. They came towards Islam. Why? Because that is how Islam should really be. We are ambassadors. You are sent here for a purpose and a mission. Do not waste your life on drugs and alcohol. Do not waste your life torturing your parents and then becoming a tragedy that they cry over for the rest of their life. 1920, maybe it was destined. This was Kismat, Muqaddar. It was written they were going to go. But... Did we not choose to drive fast? When I put the foot down, I make that choice. That's me. I can't blame him or her or him or her. No. It is a choice that I make. And if it's a choice I make and I get caught, then I must pay the price. There's a consequence. Do not think that I'll do one thing and the other is not going to happen. No. It's wrong. You can't get away. And if you do get away, and you get away from Dan and the police force, well done. Great work. But I tell you what, Allah is watching, and you cannot run away from God. You will be held accountable one day. On that day, every evidence will be presented against you. اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون. Surah Yasin. Allah says on that day, Naqtimu ala afwahihim. We will seal their mouths. We will seal their mouths. Wa tashhadu arjuluhum. And your arjulukum, your legs will talk against you. Your body parts will speak against you. Bima kanu yaksibun. What did you used to do? How did you live your life? Do you, are you really scared of Allah? Let me ask this question. Are you really scared of Allah Jalla Jalalu? Do you have the fear of Allah in your heart? Every person will say, yes, I fear Allah. I fear Allah. I fear. What fear? You sin against Allah, but you fear Him. You sin, but you fear. How can you sin and fear? If you fear, you don't sin. If you sin, you don't fear. You can't have both. This is why my brothers and sisters wake up and realize life is not a joke. Life is precious. 
and other lives are also precious. His life is as precious as mine. That's why when you save one person, it's as if you have saved entire humanity. If you have saved one person, but if you've killed one person, it's as if you have killed entire humanity. It's as if you have killed entire humanity. And if that is the case, then what is to be of that murderer who took the life of someone? If I'm driving a car recklessly and there are two other people in that car, who is responsible for their death? Question. Who is responsible? Me. I chose to drive recklessly knowing my brothers were sat in that car. I crashed. I survived. They died. Is it not manslaughter? Is it not murder or in the second degree? Of course. I will be questioned if I live. And if I don't, then the Almighty will ask, what did you do? Why did you do this? What did you do? How did you die? You died like, why? How did they die? When they, were, when they will be asked, they'll say, he drove recklessly. He is responsible for our death as well. How sad that we have to be in a position like this. It is not worth it. If you want that thrill, go hire a racetrack. Go get a good car. Put a helmet on. Pad yourself up. Even then, there's no guarantee. Even then, there's no guarantee. These cars, we say, they're death traps. They're not. They're nice cars. The moment you have a death trap mentality, that now car becomes a death trap. Those young brothers, they passed away in a what? BMW 1 Series. They did not pass away in a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. They did not pass away in a Range Rover. A, Bentley, a BMW 1 Series is a normal car. Normal car. The moment that car impacted, if that metal didn't survive, do you really think man's flesh would? Bones would? Allahu Akbar. Can you imagine? Just for one moment. What was going through their minds? What was going through the minds of young people who have lost their life like this? Put yourself in their boots. Imagine. What's the statistic? 23 deaths already in, Bradford, in, in our district this year. 74% more than last year already. And we've got four months left. Four months left. Reckless driving last night led to a young woman intensive care. Led him to intensive care. Why? Was it worth it? You've dodged one car, other car you've gone through. You ain't no bad boy driver. You are not Michael Schumacher. You know who Michael Schumacher is? We all know who Michael is. Formula One, six-time world champion. What happened to Michael Schumacher on that ski slope? What happened to him? Lost his brain, everything. Why? When you put yourself in scenarios, dangerous circumstances, it's not worth it. It ain't worth it. Believe me. Your children are worth more your time than your absence. Your parents need you more than your absence. They need your presence, not your absence. Don't allow you, yourself, your absence to become a scenario where for the rest of your lives, their lives, your mother and father are crying. Crying. What are parents doing right now? What are they doing? Neglecting their children. They don't communicate with them. What communication does your father have with you and mother have with you? In one room, father takes the son and you're sat together. If it's a joke, good joke. But it's happening. Father takes mother or takes children in one room. No relationship. No communication. When you want them to be alright, give them the iPad. Give them mobile phones. Give them freedom. But they don't monitor it. Lack of responsibility as a father. Lack of responsibility as a mother. How can you allow your six, seven year old son take an iPad and let them watch whatever they want, uncensored. And you don't know what's going on. You don't know what your son's doing online. 
You don't know what's going on in the streets. You are not oblivious. You are not carrying your responsibility as it should be carried. You are not carrying that. Masjids. How many young people go to the masjid other than the Friday prayer? Where? Where's that Fajr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha? Where are the youth? What are they doing? They're out causing terror. They're out there causing problems to the families, to people. For what? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? And why? Shall I tell you why? I will openly say, masjids have been established in Bradford for over 50 years. When they were established, they fulfilled their purpose and objective. Right now, I am sorry to say, I am sorry to say, masjids are failing. Masjids are failing. Young people are not coming to the house of God for guidance. You know who they go to? The wannabes. They turn to the street. The street is going to help me. The street ain't going to help you. Those streets will stay. You will go. You are bad today. Tomorrow there's another bad man that's going to turn up. And after you there's another one. And that's it. We take each other's place. Before you know it, the world will end. And this is how it continues. My brothers and sisters, you should go to your masjids and you should say to them, what are you doing for me? You have a right to ask the masjids, what are you doing for me? Are you educating me? Are you welcoming me? If your masjid does not allow that opportunity to be asked that question, then by Allah on the day of judgment, they will be held accountable and responsible. They have played a part in the lack of development in our youth. And then we have schools, the public sector, they work hard. I am ashamed and I'm very sorry that I feel embarrassed when I hear young lads saying, you know those pigs, the police, the 5-0, mame, chache, whatever you call them, they caused my brother to die. No got it wrong they do not train to kill they they are trained to save their job is to make your life safe they are paid our hard-earned money tax that they get paid to save our life we have a right to question them as they have a right to save our life they are in a position of responsibility I don't want to hear a young man saying that police officer killed no he didn't if he's pulled you over, pull over. What are you going to get? Three points? Ban license? Your life was saved, wasn't it? You're still walking, aren't you? You still got your freedom, haven't you? And if it's really bad, I'm sorry. You don't deserve your freedom. Why should you be free on the streets if you're a danger to society? You should be locked up. That's why prisons were made. Why are the police there? To make it safe. We should thank Allah, first and foremost, that we live in a country where we are afforded such safety. We are afforded such safety. If you go back to our homeland, you've seen police brutality in Mirpur. You've seen police brutality in Peshawar. You see, America, first world country, world power, and I'll say this openly, black lives matter, don't they? How easily are black lives getting killed by police officers there? Do our police officers target us and kill us? Do they put guns to our heads? No. I can go over to Dan and speak to him. I guarantee he will sit there for the next hour even and he will talk to you. No issues. Do you know why? Because they are not trained to react against you. They are in a position of power where what they say can change people's lives. What they do changes and saves people's lives. You have to understand the circumstance and situation and scenario that you're living in. It is the easy, ignorant way out. The police, the pigs, they did that to me. No, they didn't. I'm sorry. You've got it wrong. You should retouch Rakat Nafal to Allah and thank Him that you live in England. You live in the Great Britain. You live here. You should thank Allah. If you was in Pakistan now, how would it be? You wouldn't have the koti that you have now, would you? Now you've got those koti, where do you make that money? Where? 
here. You didn't make it there, you made it here. So you should respect the law of this land. You should obey the law of this land. Look, just be human. Be simple. Be real. Don't waste your life. Cars, drugs, alcohol, thug life, mentality, social media, none of this is worth it. It's not worth losing your life over and ending up in there because of that. No. My father, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, in the end, he passed away of kidney failure and heart failure. He passed away after a year and a half of struggle. He passed away, it was inevitable. I accept this, Alhamdulillah. He didn't pass away because of drug abuse. He didn't pass away because of alcohol abuse. He didn't pass away because of these issues. No. He did not pass in this manner. Why do you want to leave this world in a car? You, you think you're cool? You're not cool. I'm sorry, brother. You're not cool. You're a fool. There's no coolness in it. It's foolishness. You're an absolute fool. There's so many brothers sat here who once upon a time, they were at that stage of their life. Today, Allah guided them. Allah has guided them. They've calmed down, took responsibility, matured. You know, I was sat with some of the lads at the barbers, and I said, I said, boys, you guys did this as well. What's the difference? You're now 32, 33. Ten years ago, you were hiding cars and doing stuff. What's the difference? He said, we feared our parents. We have haya inside us. We are ashamed. If I do wrong, and when I've done wrong, I feel ashamed. We have this inside us. Today's kids, they have no shame left. I'm sorry to say. There's no shame left. And what did the Prophet Sallallahu say? Al-Haya shu'batum min shu'ab al-Iman. Wa la imana liman la haya alahu. Modesty, having shame with your actions and whatever you do, having modesty inside you what is this shu'batum min shu'ab al-iman the prophet sallallahu said it's a branch from the branches of iman he who has no haya has no iman where's that haya gone you know in our language what's haya sharm gharat when you have no gharat and sharm left then you have no iman you're bayman you are bayman. But the moment you have sharam and gharat inside you, then you have iman inside you. My brothers and sisters, Allah is watching. He sees everything we do. Wake up. Don't waste your life. Turn back to Allah before it's too late. I will not say what others have said, that you're going to the hellfire. I say, He has given you another day, another chance. Turn back to Him. It's not too late. Believe you me, I, am, I feel very cool being who I am with my beard. This is cool. I find it more cool than what lads out there are doing. Believe me, Islam is not rigid and strict. It is relaxed. The Prophet ﷺ, people have portrayed the Prophet والسلام, as someone who was always strict. No. There was someone who used to smile. Nobody smiled more than the Prophet ﷺ. When they used to smile, the pre-molars used to show. There was one companion, and I finish on this story. There was one companion, because Salatul Maghrib is close. There was one companion. He used to always buy gifts for the Prophet He used to go to the shopkeeper, buy the gift. But he said, I won't pay now, I'll pay you later. So like we go to Ahmed Foods or Seafresh and we have tabs, business tabs. You buy and then in credit later you'll give it back to them, you're in debt, etc. So he used to do this. He used to go, he used to buy, come. One day the shopkeeper said, this guy has bought too much, he owes me now. So he took the gift and he ran. He ran until he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid. He came inside, Nabi Ali Salam was sat and all the Sahaba was sat. He came running inside 
and he fell into the blessed feet. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I've bought you a gift. And he gave the gift. The Prophet والسلام, looked at him. As he was giving the gift, the shopkeeper was behind him, my money, where's my money? You haven't paid me. He looked at the Prophet وسلم, and said, Ya Rasulullah, I got you the gift, but you pay for it now. All those gifts, every single one of them. Do you know what the Prophet ﷺ did? They smiled and laughed as you did. Not as you now, but they smiled. And they said to the Sahaba, go pay his debt off. You know what this man, and eventually what happened to him? He had a bad habit of drinking alcohol. This very same Sahabi who was known as the Mazzah of the Prophet ﷺ, he was the jester of Rasulullah ﷺ, he drank. He got caught drinking and he was lashed 80 times because of that. Everyone inside the city of Medina started to curse him. And the Prophet ﷺ stood up and they said, do not curse him. For he loves Allah and his Rasul. Because someone's done wrong, we should not condemn them to the hellfire. We should give them opportunity to change and reform and become better people. My mission and vision is this, that we collectively as a community come together with the police, with the councillors, with the government, with the pr prominent influential people in our city here, Bradford, and we make Bradford a better place. For too long, we have brushed many issues under the carpet. Mental health, disability, antisocial behavior, drugs, alcohol, gambling. All of these issues that our youth are facing, we should be in a position where they turn to us and say, help me. I need your help. You're, it's not embarrassing to say, I need your help. Turn to the people of Allah. You are turning to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Allah will, you go walking to Allah, Allah will come running to you, metaphorically speaking. Do not lose hope in Allah's mercy. Have hope. You can be a better person. Your mother did not give you birth as a gangster. She, you didn't come into this world as a thug. You was that sad little boy or happy little boy that was there and you grew up and then because of what was around you, you became this, in your own world, some big timer. But in reality, you're just a very minute person among seven billion and you should become bigger than that by being better and good. Contribute to your society. Don't destroy your society. And this is why it's very important for us as Muslims to understand what I have said. And may Allah Jalla Jalaluhu allow us to go towards His path. And may we change. May we become better for the greater good of us, our families, our society, our community. And may we become positive examples and role models. Inshallah, there will be many more talks like this. The last time I did a talk like this was when Five years ago, five years ago I did this gangster's paradise, thug life, want to be a bad boy. Some of you might have been 13 then, now 18, 19, might have been 20 then, 25. You know, five years is a long time. I was 23 then, I'm now 28. So these talks are more needed now than ever before. I don't know yet. <laughs> Any, anyhow, just a few announcements before I finish and then we have Salatul Maghrib. I am conscious of the time, but Isha hasn't started yet, so uh, it's not something to worry. We have started a class for 14, 15, 16 year olds, specific class just for them, where they read a bit of Quran, but they develop themselves to become better people. If you have sons that are 14, 15, 16, who have read the Quran in the masjid, then please bring them to us. 
we have started a specific class for them and we will be working with the police and the fire department and the NHS and bringing them in and training those young kids to become better people, development. We need to develop our youth. We can't let them run free and then they get developed from everywhere else. No. So development is key. This class will be starting in September. If you want more information, Hafiz Asad, who will be teaching that class, and myself, will be, sta will be standing outside at the main entrance. I would also uh, like to mention that we have other classes for children. If you want to study in our madrasa, we are now nearly touching 500 children. We are nearly touching 500 children, so you are most welcome to come and enroll your children here. We have classes on weekdays and weekends. You can get more information on our website, www.alhikam.org. And this is a general invite from me to all of you. Come and be part of our masjid. Volunteer. Me, along with Aurangzeb, will be delivering a specific course on how to wash dead bodies. Be aware of that. Follow me on social media, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. And on there, I will announce it when we will be doing that workshop here. I want, you know, how many of you come here now? Again. Kabir, how many guys wash bodies on the Muslim funeral services? But generally, how many? It's poor. It's sad. Sometimes there's cases where he has to ring Aurangzeb and say what? Bro, you have to wash the body. There's no, we've got nobody else. There's not enough people stepping forward to do this good deed. We need to create a very good uh, backup support system for the funeral services. So that's at the graveyard. Adil, I remember when we early started in the early days, now it's continued, cleaning the graveyard project. Young lads go to the graveyard, spend some time there. By Allah, chill there. Take lessons from there. For you're going to end up there one day. If you are not preparing for that then, uh, now you're going to have to go there then anyway. So, I, this is an open invitation. If you want to be a part of our volunteer base here at Al Hikam, you are most welcome. We are growing all the time. We welcome people to come forward and assist. I especially, especially urge sisters. We are really struggling on the sister side. We are really struggling on the sister side. We don't have enough sisters helping us. So if there are sisters who want to volunteer and help, stay behind after. I'll come over and mention and then we can take it from there insha'Allah. I'd like to thank finally Superintendent Dan Greenwood from the police for coming. Jazakumullah khair, thank you very much. You took time out, I know you was on your holiday, you was prompted by uh, Munir Akta and Kev and Adam and all the, your team that look, get here, get here, get here. So thank you very much. Richard Dumba through uh, Councillor Nazim, uh, you know, Azam who sat here, thank you for arranging for Richard to come over and I hope that we can do some more work together. I'd like to thank Viv who has come from the TNA who is going to be doing a coverage of this event. Uh, I think she's got plenty of pictures and photos. She'll draft up a report and it will go in to the newspaper as well. This is something positive Bradford's doing. This is the press that we need. We need the press to come and uh, put highlight the good work the Muslim Asian community is doing in Bradford. I'd like to thank the Lord Mayor as well Zafar Ali Saab for on uh, such short notice of coming Allah Almighty bless them I'd like to thank Councillor Jabbar who has assisted and helped uh, I think Sinead Ingle is here as well I'd like to thank her, she's the Councillor Ward for the Fairweather Green area I'd also like to make a special dua for Shaquille Lal, who is a Councillor her father passed away, she's here as well this week has been a tough week for her and her family and I've been there and assisted as much as I could I do apologize if it wasn't enough but we make dua for her father. Her father was a good man. Allah Almighty grant him a high place in Jannatul Firdaus. I'd like to also thank Chaudhry Imran Saab, who from the Sunni Foundation, soon he will be opening a madrasa in Manningham. And we should support him. I have been with him. He never mentions this, but I have always been with him, behind him, in whatever he has done. And inshallah, he's doing a great work and service to our community. And soon he will be opening a madrasa in the Manningham area. So he will be contributing to that area uh, as much as we are in this area and within Bradford. Also like to thank Brother Razak uh, for 
helping me, assisting me, bringing the sound, even though it took a bit of time, in the end it's crisp. Uh, Tawheed, other brothers who are sat here, the volunteers, Shaf, Bilal, Hamza, Israr, all of these guys who are here, Jazakumullah Khair. I'm going to request and just say to the councillors, I think we're outgrowing this place now. There's too many people walking out from those back halls. People are in the offices as well. Sadaq uh, we rakna. Keep an eye on us and look after us as well. We need to expand this place and we need to grow and contribute positively to the well-being and the betterment of Bradford to make it a safe and better place. And Aurangzeb, thank you very much. I was actually going to say his speech, I didn't need to do after him. It was very powerful. You know, there was one point which was very moving. When he said that gangsters, you are no gangsters. I'm sorry to say, you're not a gangster. If you can't wash your dad's body, or you can't wash your brother's body, or you can't stand there, you think you've got a big heart? you got no heart. That man's got a big heart. He has kidney issues. He starts to uh, sweat a lot when he's in uh, certain uh, uh, situations. He, he's working full time, but he still takes time out. These are our heroes. These are our role models. He's a father, he has a daughter, he has a son, Shamas, these guys. And he still does that. And you know, we've got to support him and we've got to make the next Aurangzeb. Not as big as him. <laughs> Not as big as him, but just as smart as he is. So, Alhamdulillah, Allah give him great jaza and khair. Allah give him ajr. Remember him in your duas and one day, how we are washing, he's washing our dead's bodies. You know, there will come a day where we will have to wash yours, my brother. That's the truth. And I don't say as, the, as a joke or anything. This is life. Today I'm here, tomorrow I'm gone. Today you're here, tomorrow you're gone. I still remember the day Atar was sat in my talk five years ago. Today he's not here. I still remember the day Shafsun used to come and listen to my talks. He's not here. People come and go in dramatic circumstances. I'm sure these young lads, Murtaza and all these lot, they all knew who I was. I'm in Bradford. I remember them eating with me in fresh fillings. Today they're not here. Let's not be put ourselves in those scenarios. Life is precious, my brothers and sisters. Don't waste your life. It's not worth it. For a temporary buzz, it's not worth it. Jannat is worth it. Work for your place in paradise. May Allah give you jazai khair. I'm going to do the adhan. How we're going to do this is everyone stand up and just make your rows like this. So make your rows. If you don't have wudu, make your wudu. Open the library area, the back halls, just make your sufuf and then we'll do it from there. Eh? No, no. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah.